This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlords of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs and read by J. D. Weber on the south shores of Lake Superior. Chapter 10 In Durance The public houses of Barsoom, I have found, vary but little. There is no privacy for other than married couples. Men without their wives are escorted to a large chamber, the floor of which is usually of white marble or heavy glass, kept scrupulously clean. Here are many small raised platforms for the guest's sleeping silks and furs, and if he have none of his own clean, fresh ones are furnished at a nominal charge. Once a man's belongings have been deposited upon one of these platforms, he is a guest of the house, and that platform his own until he leaves. No one will disturb or molest his belongings, as there are no thieves upon Mars. As assassination is the one thing to be feared, the proprietors of the hostelries furnish armed guards, who pace back and forth through the sleeping rooms day and night. The number of guards and the gorgeousness of their trappings quite usually denote the status of the hotel. No meals are served in these houses, but generally a public eating place adjoins them. Baths are connected with the sleeping chambers, and each guest is required to bathe daily or depart from the hotel. Usually, on a second or third floor, there is a large sleeping room for single women guests, but its appointments do not vary materially from the chamber occupied by men. The guards who watch the women remain in the corridor outside the sleeping chamber, while female slaves pace back and forth among the sleepers within ready to notify the warriors should their presence be required. I was surprised to note that all the guards with the hotel at which we stopped were red men, and on inquiring of one of them I learned that they were slaves purchased by the proprietors of the hotels from the government. The man whose post was past my sleeping platform had been commander of the navy of a great Martian nation, but fate had carried his flagship across the ice barrier within the radius of power of the magnetic shaft and now for many tedious years he had been a slave of the yellow men. He told me that princes, jeds, and even jeddiks of the outer world were among the menials who served the yellow race, but when I asked him if he had heard of the fate of Mors Kajak or Tardos Mors, he shook his head, saying that he never had heard of their being prisoners here, though he was very familiar with the reputations and fame they bore in the outer world. Neither had he heard any rumor of the coming of the father of Therns and the black detour of the firstborn, but he hastened to explain that he knew little of what took place within the palace. I could see that he wondered not a little that a yellow man should be so inquisitive about certain red prisoners from beyond the ice barrier, and that I should be so ignorant of customs and conditions among my own race. In fact, I had forgotten my disguise upon discovering a red man pacing before my sleeping platform but his growing expression of surprise warned me in time, for I had no mind to reveal my identity to any unless some good could come of it, and I did not see how this poor fellow could serve me yet, though I had it in my mind that later I might be the means of serving him and all the other thousands of prisoners who do the bidding of their stern masters in Cadabra. Thuvan Din and I discussed our plans as we sat together among our sleeping silks and furs that night, in the midst of the hundreds of yellow men who occupied the apartment with us. We spoke in low whispers, but, as that is only what courtesy demands in a public sleeping place, we roused no suspicion. At last, determining that all must be but idle speculation until after we had had a chance to explore the city and attempt to put into execution the plan that Talul had suggested, we bade each other good night and turned to sleep. After breakfasting the following morning, we set out to see Cadabra, and as, through the generosity of the Prince of Marantina, we were well supplied with the funds current in Okar, we purchased a handsome ground flyer. Having learned to drive them while in Marantina, we spent a delightful and profitable day exploring the city, and late in the afternoon, at the hour Talul told us we would find government officials in their offices, we stopped before a magnificent building on the plaza opposite the royal grounds and the palace. Here we walked boldly in past the armed guard at the door, to be met by a red slave within who asked our wishes. Tell Sorav, your master, that two warriors from Ilal wish to take service in the palace guard, I said. Sorav, Talul had told us, was the commander of the forces of the palace. 
and as men from the further cities of Okar, and especially Ilal, were less likely to be tainted with the germ of intrigue which had for years infected the household of Salensis Ol, he was sure that we would be welcomed and few questions asked us. He had primed us with such general information as he thought would be necessary for us to pass muster before Sorab, after which we would have to undergo a further examination before Salensis Ol, that he might determine our physical fitness and our ability as warriors. The little experience we had had with the strange hooked sword of the yellow man and his cup-like shield made it seem rather unlikely that either of us could pass this final test. But there was the chance that we might be quartered in the palace of Salensis Ol for several days after being accepted by Sorav before the Jeddak of Jeddaks would find time to put us to the final test. After a wait of several minutes in an antechamber, we were summoned into the private office of Sorav, where we were courteously greeted by this ferocious-appearing black-bearded officer. He asked us our names and stations in our own city, and having received replies that were evidently satisfactory to him, he put certain questions to us that Talu had foreseen and prepared us for. The interview could not have lasted over ten minutes when Sorav summoned an aide whom he instructed to record us properly, and then escort us to the quarters in the palace which are set aside for aspirants to membership in the palace guard. The aide took us to his own office first, where he measured and weighed and photographed us simultaneously with a machine ingeniously devised for that purpose, five copies being instantly reproduced in five different offices of the government two of which are located in other cities miles distant. Then he led us through the palace grounds to the main guardroom of the palace, there turning us over to the officer in charge. This individual again questioned us briefly, and finally dispatched a soldier to guide us to our quarters. These were found located upon the second floor of the palace in a semi-detached tower at the rear of the edifice. When we asked our guide why we were quartered so far from the guardroom, he replied that the custom of the older members of the guard are picking quarrels with aspirants to try their mettle had resulted in so many deaths that it was found difficult to maintain the guard at its full strength while this custom prevailed. Salensis Ol had, therefore, set apart these quarters for aspirants, and here they were securely locked against the danger of attack by members of the guard. This unwelcome information put a sudden check to all our well-laid plans for it meant that we should virtually be prisoners in the palace of Salensis Ol until the time that he should see fit to give us the final examination for efficiency. As it was this interval upon which we had banked to accomplish so much in our search for Deja Thors and Thuvia of Parth, our chagrin was unabounded when we heard the great lock click behind our guide, as he had quitted us after ushering us into the chambers we were to occupy. With a wry face I turned to Thuvan Din. My companion but shook his head disconsolately and walked to one of the windows upon the far side of the apartment. Scarcely had he gazed beyond them than he called to me in a tone of suppressed excitement and surprise. In an instant I was by his side. Look, said Thuvandin, pointing toward the courtyard below. As my eyes followed the direction indicated, I saw two women pacing back and forth in an enclosed garden. At the same moment I recognized them. They were Deja Thors and Thuvi of Parth. There were they whom I had trailed from one pole to another, the length of a world. Only ten feet of space and a few metal bars separated me from them. With a cry I attracted their attention, and as Deja Thors looked up full into my eyes, I made the sign of love that the men of Barsoom make to their women. To my astonishment and horror her head went high and as a look of utter contempt touched her finely chiseled features, she turned her back full upon me. My body is covered with the scars of a thousand conflicts, but never in all my long life have I suffered such anguish from a wound, for this time the steel of a woman's look had entered my heart. With a groan I turned away and buried my face in my arms. I heard Thuvandin call aloud to Thuvia. But an instant later his exclamation of surprise betokened that he too had been repulsed by his own daughter. They will not even listen, he cried to me. They have put their hands over their ears and walked to the further end of the garden. Ever heard you of such mad work, John Carter? The two must be bewitched. Presently I mustered the courage to return to the window, 
for even though she spurned me, I loved her, and could not keep my eyes from feasting upon her divine face and figure. But when she saw me looking, she again turned away. I was at my wit's end to account for her strange actions, and that Thuvia too had turned against her father seemed incredible. Could it be that my incomparable princess still clung to the hideous faith from which I had rescued her world? Could it be that she looked upon me with loathing and contempt because I had returned from the valley door, or because I had desecrated the temples and persons of the holy therns? To naught else could I ascribe her strange deportment, yet it seemed far from possible that such could be the case, for the love of Dejah Thors for John Carter had been a great and wondrous love, far above racial distinctions, creed, or religion. As I gazed ruefully at the back of her haughty, royal head, a gate at the opposite end of the garden open, and a man entered. As he did so, he turned and slipped something into the hand of the yellow guardsman beyond the gate. Nor was the distance too great that I might not see that money had passed between them. Instantly I knew that this newcomer had bribed his way within the garden. Then he turned in the direction of the two women, and I saw that he was none other than Thurid, the black detour of the firstborn. He approached quite close to them before he spoke and as they turned at the sound of his voice I saw Dejah Thoris shrink from him. There was a nasty leer upon his face as he stepped close to her and spoke again. I could not hear his words, but her answer came clearly. The granddaughter of Tardos Morse can always die, she said, but she could never live at the price you name. Then I saw the black scoundrel go upon his knees beside her, fairly groveling in the dirt, pleading with her. Only part of what he said came to me, for though he was evidently laboring under the stress of passion and excitement, it was equally apparent that he did not dare raise his voice for fear of detection. I would save you from Mata Shang, I heard him say. You know the fate that awaits you at his hand. Would you not choose me rather than the other? I would choose neither, replied Dejah Thoris. Even were I free to choose, as you know well I am not. You are free, he cried. John Carter, Prince of Helim, is dead. I know better than that. But even were he dead, and I must needs choose another mate, it should be a plant man or a great white ape in preference to either Mata Shang or you, Black Kalat, she answered with a sneer of contempt. Of a sudden the vicious beast lost all control of himself, as with a vile oath he leaped at the slender woman, gripping her tender throat in his brute clutch. Thuvia screamed and sprang to aid her fellow prisoner and at the same instant I too went mad, and tearing at the bars that spanned my window, I ripped them from their sockets as they had been but copper wire. Hurling myself through the aperture, I reached the garden, but a hundred feet from where the black was choking the life from Dejah Thors, and with a single great bound I was upon him. I spoke no word as I tore his defiling fingers from that beautiful throat, nor did I utter a sound as I hurled him twenty feet from me. Foaming with rage, Thurid regained his feet and charged me like a mad bull. Yellow man, he shrieked, you knew not upon whom you had laid your vile hands, but ere I am done with you, you will know well what it means to offend the person of a firstborn. Then he was upon me, reaching for my throat, and precisely as I had done that day in the courtyard of the temple of Ishus, I did here in the garden of the palace of Salensis Ol, I ducked beneath his outstretched arms, and as he lunged past me I planted a terrific right upon the side of his jaw. Just as he had done upon that other occasion he did now. Like a top he spun round, his knees gave beneath him, and he crumpled to the ground at my feet. Then I heard a voice behind me. It was the deep voice of authority that marks the ruler of men, and when I turned to face the resplendent figure of a giant yellow man, I did not need to ask to know that it was Solunsus Ol. At his right stood Mata Shang, and behind them a score of guardsmen. Who are you? he cried, and what means this intrusion within the precincts of the woman's garden? I do not recall your face. How came you here? But for his last words I should have forgotten my disguise entirely, and told him outright that I was John Carter, Prince of Helium. But his question recalled me to myself. I pointed to the dislodged bars of the window above. I am an aspirant to membership in the palace guard, I said, and from yonder window in the tower where I was confined awaiting the final test for fitness, I saw this brute attack this woman. I could not stand idly by, O Jeddak, and see this thing done within the very palace grounds, and yet feel that I was fit to serve and guard your royal person. 
I had evidently made an impression upon the ruler of Okar by my fair words, and when he had turned to Dejah Thors and Thuvia Parth, and both had corroborated my statements, it began to look pretty dark for Thurid. I saw the ugly gleam in Mata Shang's evil eyes as Dejah Thors narrated all that had passed between Thurid and herself, and when she came to that part which dealt with my interference with the detour of the firstborn, her gratitude was quite apparent though I could see by her eyes that something puzzled her strangely. I did not wonder at her attitude toward me while others were present, but that she should have denied me while she and Thuvia were the only occupants of the garden still cut me sorely. As the examination proceeded I cast a glance at Thuard and startled him looking wide-eyed and wonderingly at me, and then of a sudden he laughed full in my face. A moment later Salenza's old turned toward the black. What have you to say in explanation of these charges, he asked, in a deep and terrible voice. Dare you aspire to one whom the father of Therns has chosen, one who might even be fit mate for the Jeddak of Jeddaks himself? And then the black-bearded tyrant turned and cast a sudden greedy look upon Dejah Thoris, as though with the words a new thought and a new desire had sprung up within his mind and breast. Thuard had been about to reply, and with a malicious grin upon his face, was pointing an accusing finger at me, when Salensis Ole's words and the expression of his face cut him short. A cunning look crept into his eyes, and I knew from the expression of his face that his next words were not the ones he had intended to speak. O mightiest of Jeddaks, he said, the man and the woman do not speak the truth. The fellow had come into the garden to assist them to escape. I was beyond and overheard their conversation, and when I entered, the woman screamed, and the man sprang upon me, and would have killed me. What know you of this man? He is a stranger to you, and I dare say that you will find him an enemy and a spy. Let him be put on trial, Salensis Ole, rather than your friend and guest, Thuard de Tor of the Firstborn. Salensis Ole looked puzzled. He turned again and looked upon Dejah Thors, and then Thuard stepped quite close to him and whispered something in his ear. What I know not. Presently the yellow ruler turned to one of his officers. See that this man be securely confined until we have time to go deeper into this affair, he commanded, and as bars alone seem inadequate to restrain him, let chains be added. Then he turned and left the garden, taking Dejah Thors with him, his hand upon her shoulder. Thurid and Matashang went also, and as they reached the gateway the black turned and laughed again aloud in my face. What could be the meaning of his sudden change toward me? Could he suspect my true identity? It must be that, and the thing that had betrayed me was the trick and blow that had laid him low for the second time. As the guards dragged me away, my heart was very sad and bitter indeed, for now to the two relentless enemies that had hounded her for so long another and a more powerful one had been added for I would have been but a fool had I not recognized the sudden love for Dejah Thors that had just been born in the terrible breast of Salensis Ol, Jeddak of Jeddaks, ruler of Okar. End of chapter 10